Thank you very much, Utkash, for this warm welcome and for giving me this opportunity to be here this morning. Uh, when today's schedule for the Leadership Summit was released, I realized that my address is squeezed between the sessions of uh, George Clooney and two of my own iconic cricketers, uh, Sachin Tendulkar and Brian Lara. Uh, I thought my address will probably serve as a strategic timeout for lovers of art and cricket. Uh, but I'm happy to see that many of you have stayed back to listen to my address this morning. <laughs> Judges often come across to people as old-fashioned octogenarians because of our black gowns and, of course, the imposing regalia. When you combine that with a sonorous voice, legal language which, like the doctor's prescription, you know, the doctor's prescription only the chemist can understand, so legal language which only the lawyers can understand, it can be a heady combination for boredom, utter boredom. But to borrow the lyrics of that song from Doris Day and Frank Sinatra, we are among the very young at heart. So, so I'll begin with that this morning. I'm very often posed with questions, and uh, you also read them in the media uh, ever, so, ever so often. And those questions are, why do different judges speak with different voices, particularly in the Supreme Court? Why can't these guys agree on one set line of approach? Why is it that in very crucial cases there are multiple voices speaking from within the same court? Uh, another criticism or question is that why do you have to deal with whether or not to grant bail to somebody who has stolen uh, luxury cars or maybe cycles or who is in possession of five kilograms of opium? Why should you be really opening yourself up to deciding these cases? Or sometimes you're asked, why is it when we look at the dais on the benches of our courts, whether it's the high courts or the Supreme Court, that you see more men than women? That's the issue of diversity. Well, let me begin by telling you my perspective on the times in which we live. Soon after the birth of the Constitution, the Indian judiciary was considered to be a platform for resolving disputes under the law between citizens, between citizens and the state, and as in a country as broadly federal as we are, between states and states and states and the union. Now, the principle which the Constitution adopted in terms of the adjudicative power of the Supreme Court is of a very broad sense of access to justice. So when the Constitution was designed, the constitutional structure was to create a court which would be broad-based in opening its doors for providing access to citizens. Now, we have widened access to a point where some believe that we are increasingly becoming dysfunctional because we have so many coming into our courts. Well, one way of looking at it is to say that, well, because you have broadened access to such a large extent, you are increasingly rendering yourself dysfunctional. The other way of looking at it is that, well, that reflects the strength of our legal system, that reflects the strength of our judicial system because this is then a court where Anybody from A to Z can really, and I, when I say A to Z, I don't mean any sense of disrespect to any citizen, that anybody who is denied bail can come to the court and make a cry for personal liberty with the expectation that personal liberty would be protected. So when you compare us, say, with the US Supreme Court, which would hear about 180 cases odd in a year, or the UK Supreme Court, which would hear 85 cases in a year, we have a Supreme Court which would roughly, every judge of the Supreme Court would be reading between 75 to 80 cases every Monday, 75 to 80 cases every Friday, and then on Tuesdays, Wednesdays, and Thursdays, on an average, say, 30 or 40 cases. So that gives you the reach of the work which the Supreme Court does. Now, many of the cases which we deal with, 
are not necessarily cases which come to the newspapers or cases which are even considered to be significant enough to be dealt with on social media. Most of these cases which we deal with are routine cases. And there again, one way of looking at it is, should a Supreme Court judge in whom the country has invested so much in terms of your training, in terms of your salary, in terms of, you know, CTC to the nation, be dealing with these small cases. Somebody's pension has not been paid. Uh, a woman who has been deserted by her husband is not being paid, say, 5,000 rupees a month is maintenance. A woman who wants to terminate a pregnancy and she's denied the right to terminate a pregnancy. Should the court be dealing with these cases? And my answer simply is obviously yes. There's no doubt about it. That that is indeed the role of the Supreme Court. Once we really conceive of the basic constitutional structure and design, it's important that we don't equate ourselves with Supreme Courts, constitutional courts in other countries. We may call them developed countries. Because we have a uniquely Indian structure for our own institution, which lies at the, at the highest level of the court system in India. So having said that, and having laid down, therefore, the basic framework for the functioning of our courts, what kind of challenges do we really face in today's times? I think the first challenge that we face is the challenge of expectations. And that's a huge challenge for the court. Almost every case comes into the lap. Every social issue, every legal issue, and I dare say a large number of political issues, fall within the adjudicatory jurisdiction of the Supreme Court. The reasons for that are numerous. Very often, the government is the largest litigant in the court. And the reason why the government is the largest litigant in the court is for the simple reason that we have, over the last 70 years, bred a culture of indecision, a culture of indecision at the lowest levels of government. So be it a case of a pension, a case of compassionate appointment for a woman who has lost a spouse while in service, who wants a job in a, in, a, in, a, in a government department. There's always a tendency. There's also a culture of distrust. And that culture of distrust leads many of our top decision makers to be very careful about taking decisions having a bearing on very high stakes. Would there be a vigilance inquiry if the person were to be promoted or were to lay down office? Would there be possibly an allegation that you made a concession to a, a corporate enterprise and which would be investigated into 10 years down the line? So a variety of reasons in the Indian context have led to a culture of distrust and therefore a culture of indecision on the part of public functionaries. Now all those cases are therefore deferred to the court. We'd rather have the court decide than us taking a decision. That's one of the reasons why the courts have a large backlog of cases within the uh, fold of cases that we decide. The other reason, apart from the culture of distrust, is possibly more optimistic, which is a culture of faith, that there is something which will happen in my favor in the court. Now, we have been dealing with a variety of disputes. As you know, we've dealt with some of them Utkash stressed on a short while ago. Uh, should you have the continuance of Section 377 of the Penal Code on our statute books, a colonial era law which made it an offense to have sexual intercourse against carnal intercourse against the order of nature, which basically reached out against the LGBTQI community. Should privacy be a fundamental right? So that came to the court. Is the right to a clean environment a fundamental right? Should women be in the armed forces? For instance, when we were dealing with the uh, Armed Forces Permanent Commission issue, the Navy told us that, well, there's one critical reason why we can't have women in the Navy, which is that our Russian warships have no facility for a separate toilet for women. So we said, well, that's bad enough, but that's no reason to deny entry to women. So this is the generation of people's expectations in the court, which leads to the proliferation of litigation. 
I say that with a sense of optimism, but that's also a great challenge and a sobering reflection for a judge, which is that are we really capable of handling all these issues which come to us? Is that truly the function of the court? Now, one critical area which the court has to deal with when you deal with these cases is how do you distinguish between the line of policy and legality? Very often, the court is criticized that you have trenched upon an area of policy, whereas your function as judges is only to decide upon legality. Now, there is no doubt about the fact that in a democratic form of government, particularly in a country like ours, we have a constitutional democracy, policy making is entrusted to the executive arm of the government because the executive is responsible to parliament and therefore it is their duty to lay down policy. It is their duty to enact laws. But equally, our constitution has a structural design where the power to interpret laws the power to strike down a law which is not consistent with constitutional mandate is entrusted to the judiciary and the judiciary alone. Now, when we look at the constitutional structure from that point of view, then, it becomes very obvious that this generation of people's expectations has a flip side as well. And that flip side is each of us in the Supreme Court and in the high courts have to constantly ask ourselves, is this case really meet for judicial standards? You have, for instance, cases which are not meet for judicial standards. Should a statue be located in a particular choraha? Should a city be renamed to something else? Purely political decisions. But then the difficulty arises when you have cases which really have shading facets of legality and shading facets of policy. So very often in the work which courts do, it's not very easy to distinguish between what lies in the realm of policy and what lies in the realm of legality, whether it's in the context of, say, a SEBI regulation, whether it's in the context of regulating the social media, or a whole host of issues which come before us as judges. Now, social media has posed for us one of the greatest challenges of our times. None of us who are judges today were trained as lawyers or as law students in the era of the social media. Say in the 1970s or the 1980s, only those cases ever came to in the public scrutiny with, say, a Hindustan Times reporter, Mr. Krishan Mahajan in those days, would find reporting or newsworthy and come out with a little column in the next day's newspapers. So there would be a column or two either in the Times or the Express or the Hindustan Times or the Telegraph or the Statesman. What's happened with social media is this. There is real-time reporting of every word that the judge says in court. Now, those of you who are lawyers would be able to tell your colleagues here that everything that is said by a judge in the course of a conversation in the court does not reflect either the mind of the judge or the ultimate conclusion which the judge would arrive at. The process of judging that goes on in our courts is dialogic. It's dialogic in the sense that there is a free-flowing dialogue between the lawyers in the court or between the judges between themselves in an effort to unravel the truth or to unravel the shades of the truth which come up for decision-making. So very often in the court, you will find two, two types of judges. You have judges who play the devil's advocate. So when a lawyer gets up, a judge will tell you why you're wrong and what are the problems or the deficiencies in the structure of your submissions. At the other end of the spectrum, you have judges who will stretch your line of argument to its logical conclusion. So very often the lawyer will say, but oh my God, I didn't even realize that this could be the logical consequence of my submissions. But what is going on in the court, whether you have one brand of judges or the other brand of judges, or sometimes people follow a hybrid of, two, of the two models, is that there is a free-flowing dialogue between one segment of the court, a vital stakeholder at the bar, and the court, the judges who represent the other vital stake in the functioning of the, of the judicial system. But real-time reporting in the courtrooms today, by the second, every little word that the judge says is put out on Twitter, 
or it's put out in any of the, uh, or, or it's, it may be put out on Telegram or Instagram, and you're constantly evaluated as a judge by what you say. Now, if you have judges who then decide to keep quiet and not say things when arguments are going on, that would pose a very grave danger to the process of judicial decision making. Because the ability of a lawyer to meet an argument, to answer the concerns of the judge, and to explore the mind of the judge or the line of reasoning of a judge is critical to the work which we do in the courts. Now, social media has challenged that assumption. What do we do? We live in the area, we live in the era of the internet. We live in an era of the social media. It's here to stay. So I do believe that we need to fashion, we need to re-engineer ourselves as judges. We need to refashion ourselves, find new solutions, retrain ourselves, recoup ourselves, rethink our role in trying to understand how we meet the challenges of the age in which we live. A very crucial mission which I've followed as a chairperson of the E-Committee has been the live streaming of cases. When the COVID-19 pandemic descended upon us in March of 2020, we had two options. We couldn't function in the physical sense, and the only other option was to shut down the courts. You can shut down maybe a factory, but you cannot shut down access to justice. So we had in place a robust infrastructure of technology, and we used the on-screen facilities which we had. We bought mics so that we could have better receptivity. Now, we live in a country where access to the internet is not uniform. You have areas of the country where the bandwidth which is required for robust video conferencing is just not available or was not available then. It's much better now. But our effort at live streaming, our effort at using the video conferencing platforms really gave us a new insight into what technology can do to transform our legal system. What technology really did for us as judges was to enable us to understand that technology has a huge potential to change the way that we have traditionally worked as judges. Our institutions have a colonial origin. When you look at the infrastructure of the oldest buildings in the country, whether it's the Bombay High Court or it's the Calcutta High Court, these are imposing buildings replete with the most intricate of architecture. They're intended to create a sense of awe in the mind of the citizen who, who approaches the court that should I transgress the limits, the authority of the law will hold out to me. That was the colonial design. But that colonial design of our democratic institutions can no longer hold good today, 75 years down independence and since the birth of the Constitution. The courts, as I consider them, as I consider them to be, we are instruments of the nation state. But equally, there is an element where we are service providers to citizens. Service providers in ensuring that citizens are entitled to access to justice under the framework of the rule of law. Now, what technology has done is to enable us to replace the traditional model where citizens had to access justice, reach out to justice, and replace that model where the courts can replace and reach out to citizens, not replace citizens, but reach out to citizens. And how do we do that? I'll give you a very simple example. We have, for instance, the e-court services, whether it's e-filing of documents uh, or virtual courts. Now, we have common service centers across India. These common service centers have been set up as part of the government's mission for digital India. We have tried to merge the e-court services with the common service corporations so that the services which we provide to citizens can reach out to every gram panchayat in India. Not just to people in the met metropolitan cities, not just the lawyers in the metropolitan cities who are well healed, they have access to the best gadgets, they have access to the best of the facilities of the internet, but reach out to that individual who has no access. Today, 76 lakh judgments of the high courts have been uploaded on the national judicial data grid. 
Now, as a result of the uploading of 76 lakh judgments of the, Nash of the Supreme Court and the High Court, on, of the High Courts in the National Judicial Data Grid, we have opened up our processes to ordinary citizens who can read our judgments, access them. We are using, in, we, are in the, in the, we are in the effort of deploying artificial intelligence to translate our judgments. Our judgments are written in English, particularly in the superior judiciary. But surely citizens for whom our judgments are meant don't necessarily know or speak English. How does a Tamil-speaking person, or how does a Manipuri who is affected by a judgment and an order of preventive detention know what the court has held? And unless a citizen in any part of the country is able to understand what was said in that judgment concerning her or a judgment concerning someone else, I think that sense of confidence in the judicial process would not be perpetuated. Because the ability of our courts to thrive as a judicial institution in our democracy lies in the confidence which we generate in the minds of, of people. Now, live streaming, which is the next stage that we have already arrived at, many high courts across the country are live streaming their proceedings. The Gujarat High Court started live streaming. Uh, so also Karnatak High Court started it. The Orissa High Court has been doing it. Delhi has uh, done some live streaming. And the Supreme Court has been live streaming all cases in, of the Constitution bench important, involving important constitutional matters. To my mind, live streaming is important because as we said in one of our judgments, sunlight is the best disinfectant. And one of the greatest dangers to institutions in a constitutional democracy is the danger of being opaque. When you open up your process, you generate a degree of accountability, you generate a degree of transparency, and you generate a sense of responsiveness to the needs of citizens. And when I speak of live streaming, you're not only talking of live streaming the big ticket cases which the Supreme Court decides, that one, that's one end of the spectrum. We need to live stream proceedings of the high courts, but of the district judiciary, because the interface of the common citizen is first and foremost with the district judiciary, a person who's arrested and is subject to an order of remand whether to police or judicial custody, comes face to face with the magistrate or the district judge. So when you live stream proceedings, I do believe that citizens are entitled to know and they have knowledge then of the kind of application of mind that goes on in the judicial functioning. There are obviously concerns about live streaming. One of the concerns is that will that lead to grandstanding by lawyers? Will lawyers be more inclined to speak to the gallery instead of to the judge? Well, everything, including, including technology, has a flip side. Technology, as we know, is not necessarily perfect. So for instance, when you use artificial intelligence to predict judicial outcomes, artificial intelligence is not gender or ideology neutral. Artificial intelligence depends upon who has programmed AI. And there's a grave danger that artificial intelligence can, if used beyond its circumscribed jurisdiction, actually affect the stereotypes which are inherent in the system. Stereotypes against women, stereotypes against the marginalized, stereotypes against the backward castes. So live streaming, to my mind, has one great potential, which is to allow citizens to open themselves up to access to justice by truly understanding what goes on behind the closed doors of courts. One great impact of the pandemic, when we video conferenced all our hearings, was a tremendous increase in the women lawyers who started appearing before the courts. And why was that? It's very simple. Ordinarily, you come to court at 10.30 in the morning, and you don't know what time your case is going to reach. As we know, most women do multifold responsibilities. Now, for a woman, to come to a court, particularly a young lawyer, to come to a court, and I see that repeatedly, can be very daunting. Because if you're not exactly, you have to you know, occupy crowded courtrooms, crowded court corridors, and you have to brush with people, all of whom may not be necessarily gender sensitive outside the portals of the court. But what live streaming did was, 
that it allowed women to be productive in the work which they do. And the number of women lawyers who have been appearing before the court has been really amazing, which is one of the real benefits which we were able to gather in terms of the use of, in, in, in terms of, the use of technology. Which leads me to the broader aspect of diversity within the judiciary. One of the questions which we are posed is this, why don't you have more women in the judiciary? Why don't you have more people belonging to the marginalized groups in the judiciary? Now, one thing which we need to understand is that the judiciary has a feeding pool. Now, which is the feeding pool for the higher judiciary? The feeding pool for the Supreme Court is either the high courts or the lawyers from the bar. What is the feeding pool for the high courts? The feeding pool for the high courts is the district judiciary or the lawyers who practice before the high courts. Now, what has happened, therefore, is that the feeding pool which determines who enters our judiciary is largely dependent on the structure of the legal profession. The structure of the legal profession even today across India is feudal, it's patriarchal, and it has not been accommodating of women. So when we talk of the need to have more women in the judiciary, it's equally necessary for us to lay the building blocks for the future by creating access to women now within the legal profession. Entering chambers of senior counsel, it's an old boys club. How do you gain, ex how do you gain access to chambers? You gain access to chambers by tapping your connections, by tapping your networks. Until we have a democratized and merit-based access to the entry point in the legal profession, we'll not have more women. We will not have more people belonging to the marginalized groups entering the profession. I have five law clerks in my office, and I've made an effort to ensure that the usual system of accessing chambers, which is that somebody calls you up and say, hey, uh, somebody I know wants access to your, to your office and you, wants to work with you for a year, must be replaced by a more merit-based system of appointment. And when I say, when I talk of merit, let's make no bones about it. Merit in the conventional sense in our society is also a product of our cultural stereotypes. Because merit is also determined by who can speak English well. Merit is also dep dependent on who went to the right colleges. Merit is also dependent on who had access to the best coaching classes when they were kids. Merit is also dependent on who learned to play the violin or the piano or went to a good club to, to learn swimming when they were nine or 10. So everything that we look up, look upon today as merit is not necessarily what merit is all about. When we seek access to our law schools, <laughs> when we seek access to our law schools today, Admission to our law schools is determined by your scores in a uniform, the common law aptitude test, the CLAT. What is a CLAT test? Does it test how you're going to be 30 years down the line when you assume a position of responsibility? Or does it just tell you whether you, whether you are able to mug your scores, your, your, your questions, you know, whether it's general knowledge or math or English in a proper way? So how do we define merit, which is the next important thing which I want to talk to you very briefly before I conclude. How do we talk about merit in terms of the entry point into the judiciary? Do we talk about merit only in terms of the income which people earn? Then typically you will have a certain kind of people entering the judiciary. Or do we also talk about merit in terms of the social ethos of the cases for whom you represent? A woman lawyer, for instance, may be appearing for, for, for labor. She may not have large fees at her command, but she's doing that as a sense of mission to the society. So I think when we talk about broadening diversity within the Indian judiciary, we also need to have a very hard look at how we conceive of merit and how we think of diversity. Why diversity? Why do you need more women judges? Is a judge not a judge? 
It does it make a difference whether you're a man or woman who is deciding a case? Why do you need more women judges in the judiciary? Is it that women bring some particular gender perspective to judging? I have sat with both my male counterparts and my uh, female counterparts, and I found that when I sat with a woman and dealt with a case, be it a case of a gender offense against a woman, you know, in the, in the criminal appeals that we hear, you will see that there is such almost a monotonous regularity of the kind of offenses which take place against a woman. I was sitting with a very distinguished colleague, Justice Ranjana Desai, when I first entered the criminal roster, and she said, Dhananjay, just watch the cases involving offenses against women. In most of them, you will find a nylon rope, a can of kerosene, and a matchstick. So there is a certain perspective, I believe, which having a broader sense of diversity brings to the judiciary. It doesn't necessarily mean that women judges will be more liberal as compared to their male counterparts. That's a wrong assumption to postulate that when you have a woman judge, she will adopt a particular ideological approach to her task of judging is wrong. It's not that men judges are you know, more conservative than their women counterparts. No, that's not my, that's not my thesis. My thesis is that there is something intrinsic about gender, irrespective of the outcomes which you arrive at in an individual case, which brings to the table a more deliberative, a more consultative, and a more dialogic process to the art and the science of judging. Now, what are the structural challenges that we face? I think one of the key structural challenges that we face in the Indian judiciary today is the challenge of the pendency of cases. Now, part of the reason for the pendency, of course, is that we have a huge backlog of cases resulting from the proliferation of litigation. 60 years ago, you had some of the basic statutes on the statute book. You had the Transfer of Property Act, the Code of Civil Procedure, the Criminal Procedure Code, the Penal Code. As our society has become more and more complex, the nature of regulation has changed. So for instance, you have the Insolvency and Bankruptcy Code now. You have a whole host of financial and economic regulatory laws. None of those laws were in force when we studied our law 30 or 40 years ago. So the consequence of the proliferation of legislation, which is not a bad thing because you need legislation to regulate the increasingly complex society in which we live, the consequence of that proliferation is that there, is new, there are new patterns of litigation which are emerging before the courts. Now, how do we deal with this increase in the, uh, the, the burden of the docket on courts? The first, I think, is to fill up vacancies. The existing vacancies in the courts need to be filled up. Second, we need to answer the infrastructural constraints of the Indian judiciary. Just yesterday, a very senior district judge from the UP High Judicial Service, who is now working with me as the Chief Justice of India, was telling me that he said that when prisoners are brought to the district court for their daily hearings, they are led into a staircase, into a basement, all of them crowded for the day into a small basement with not even the basic amenities available for, the rest, for, for, for meeting their requirements during the day. How do we... There are, there, are, there are courts in our country where there is no toilet for women. I have been administrative, an administrative judge in progressive states like the state of Maharashtra, where I found that there was absolutely no toilet for women in one of the districts where I was an administrative judge. So when I talked to this district judge who was a senior a woman from the judicial service, she said, sir, you know, I have these young girls who are in their 20s and 30s who use the washroom at 8.30 in the morning, and the next time they have to use the washroom is at 6 o'clock in the evening when they go home. So these are some of the stark realities of the Indian judicial system under which our judges work. Now, consistent with the fact that these are the stark realities of the conditions in which our judges work, I think they're doing a fantastic job. It's now becoming very easy to criticize. But while we criticize our institution 
And I don't take that criticism with a sense of being negative. But I look at all criticism in a very positive light by saying to myself that all criticism of the court is really an effort for us to reform. All critiques of the court present an effort for us to refashion, to re-engineer, and to devise new ways of doing old habits. Our core is, of course, judging. And I leave you with just one thought, which is technology, infrastructure, filling up vacancies. These are milestones in our mission. But above all, I think what sustains judicial institutions in the long run is your sense of compassion. It's your sense of empathy. And it's your ability to answer the plaintive cry of a citizen in the wilderness. Because it's when you have that ability to hear unheard voices in the system, unseen faces in the system, and then try and see where the balance between the law and justice lies, that you can truly perform your mission as a judge. Sometimes law and justice don't necessarily follow the same, the same linear trajectory. As we know, the law can be an instrument of justice, but the law can be an instrument of oppression as well. We know of how in colonial times, the same law as it exists in the statute book today could be used as an instrument of oppression. So how then as citizens do we ensure that the law becomes an instrument of justice and that the law does not become an instrument of oppression? And I think the key to ensuring that it's the one and not the other outcome which results is the way in which we handle the law. And to handle the law, I believe, all decision makers, not just judges. And I'll conclude with that by saying that it's great that we have these expectations of the citizens, but there is life beyond the law and life beyond the courts. And we need to understand the limits as well as the potentialities of our courts as institutions. We need to understand the limits of the institution because we shouldn't become cynical about the potential for doing good by the use of the law and by the use of courts as instruments to advance justice. But ultimately what it all boils down to the court, what it ultimately boils down in our day-to-day -day work as judges is your sense of justice and your sense of a robust common sense. Between those pages of legalese with which I began, there's a human story. And it's when you read between the lines that you realize what the human story is. And it's only when you realize the human story that you can perhaps have made a little, one more step towards advancing the cause of justice. To be honest, I had a prepared text this morning, but then I thought I can speak to you from the heart and share some thoughts with you. Thank you very much.